now have the wonderful honor to introduce our speaker, Judy Hale. Uh, I've got a whole list of things that she's done, and I'm going to just pick and choose a few of the big names, big items. Uh, she's been in performance, uh, performance consulting uh, in Chicago since 1974. Uh, she's got a PhD. Uh, she has been a past president of the uh, ISPI International Chapter along and was voted an uh, outstanding member of the year in 1987. She's been uh, part of the for years and years, she's authored many, many books uh, that she's got some to give out tonight. Are we yes, wrapping up? Okay. Um, some of her books will be raffled off later. So she is great. I have known her for a couple years. She's always entertaining, uh, always fun to listen to, and, uh, and definitely knows her stuff. So uh, with that introduction. I want to clarify just a couple little things here. One of the reasons I try to be entertaining is because what I talk about is dry as dirt. <laughs> you know, come on. I, I tend to talk about assessment, evaluation, measurement. Give me a break. I mean, if that's not dry as dirt, what is? But I have a great deal of passion about it, and I, I think it's need to really embrace it and do much better with it. But, uh, and if I don't do that, then no one's going to be interested in anything. So I do try to not make light of it, but maybe make light of myself and some of human foibles around those particular issues. Now, can those of you in the back hear me? Yes. You're okay? You will let me know if you cannot. That's a, that's a deal? Okay. You'll also let me know if I talk too fast? Yes. Okay. So because sometimes I can I can get on a run and you don't need me to do that. You need me to be clear and be able to understand what's going on or something like that. Tonight I'm really going to talk about a slightly different thing, and I'll talk about how I got there. This is about the politics of learning and performance. And a lot of people think, what is this about? And it's my observation that those of us in learning performance may do very, very good work, but we're very naive about our organization's politics. And therefore, sometimes our good work and ourselves get lost in that process. And my advocating is we have to get smarter. We have to really look at the politics. And, and now, what, before I go any further with that, I'm not talking about Chicago politics. <laughs> <laughs> I am from Chicago, and that is what we call the non-example. Remember, we learn from good examples and non-examples, right? So uh, I, I was uh, doing this at one of the other chapters, and some I said, you know, Illinois is kind of like in the cesspool of politics. And somebody said, no, no, New Jersey's down there too. And then somebody else offered another state. Well, apparently there's a race on in this country <laughs> about who can really do politics in the ugly, ugly fashion. That's not what I'm talking about. So I'm really talking about the fact that we need to get much smarter about politics and, and the good kind of politics if we really want our ideas to be resonate, if we want to be considered, we want to be at the table, and, and we just don't want when things get rough to get fired. So that's what I'm really talking about. So I want to leave here, with, I want you to leave here with some better understanding of good politics. What are the attributes when it's done well? And what are the things that are within your power to do now, what you can do to build on those particular things. Now I'm going to start out with a couple definitions when it relates to politics. One, what I've learned is that there's constructive politics and destructive politics. Now, when it's constructive, it's not called politics. It's called, that person's really, you know, they're kind of astute. They know how to get things done. So we just have a whole different having practical wisdom, being prudent, being expedient, process of gaining support. So the problem we have is that politics as a word has such negative overtones, connotations. And I'm telling you, when it's done well, it's never called that. You, and we, every one of us have known that person who is very prudent, knows how to work the system, and can do it with personal integrity. They can do it without ever losing sense of who they are. That's what I'm talking about our learning to be. Okay, that's what I'm referring to. So with that, it, politics is nothing more than the study of influence. It's finding out why someone else, we listen to them, we defer to them, we, we solicit their input, we, you know, those kinds of inputs. Excuse me, I 
I forgot something. Uh, I take questions. Okay? <laughs> <laughs> but you have to be overt because I am hearing impaired. I have wonderful hearing aids. And so you have to do like this so I look at you. Then I partially lift where you do that kind of stuff. So I just want you to be aware of that. Okay? But I do take questions. Well, I have them at the end, but you don't have to wait to the end if you have a dying, burning question. So that's all it's about. So anyway, I'm talking about politics as a study of influence. And it's measured on the basis of the number of shares. Now, pay attention to this concept. Shares one or a group has in the preferred values of, or attributes. The more values or, or share, the greater their influence. No single index of share. Fascinating. I, when I started researching this, I, you have the references in your materials. I looked, it was Mr. Laswell's work, L-A-S-S-W-E-L-L. -S -S -E -L -L. He's got two books in it. He is the one that really wrote about the study of politics and the study of influence. He doesn't write about how this person got elected. That's not what he's talking about. He's talking about it in a pure sense. And was one of the best to really articulate that. And he said, people have influence the more shares they have of the attributes that are valid. Hmm, what does that mean? Well, I resonate better with some clients than I do with other clients. I'm an entrepreneur in spirit. I see rules as tools not to be blindly obeyed. Therefore, I do not pursue work with clients that are not like that. So I love the military. My brother was in the military, he did all the NOM stuff. I have a, a son that was in the Navy for six years. I got a one in the Marines. Okay? Honey, I don't even attempt to sell to the military. I do not share, I am too off the charts. They can only tolerate me for a short time. That doesn't make them bad. That doesn't make me bad. It means that I really know where it is I best work. Okay? But that's an example. So if you want to go after the military, there's certain things. They're very hierarchical. They believe in certain things like that. And you have to respect that. You need to know this is a secret. I know he's taping it. But this is a secret. Before I go to the ISPI conferences, I have a job aid that tells me what the stripes mean, and stuff like that. I accidentally called a captain, a commander, and he was very polite. I caught it right away, and the next time I came back, I said, now, captain, and he smiled and acknowledged. I have to work hard at that stuff. You understand? It's too hard. I don't, it's just unnatural. So what does that mean? So I do better at companies that tend to be more entrepreneurial, tend to be more breakthrough, <coughs> things like that. I tend to resonate with those kind of people. And they like me in this. But who is it here that has another theater background? We had another person here. here. There he goes. You know, I have a theater background. I didn't do the acting. I wasn't the acting. I did behind the scenes how to pull it together and all that kind of stuff. But when you're in the theater, you do what works. You do what works. You don't necessarily do it the way it should be. And I remember I once had to come up with, uh, we were doing Richard the, the uh, uh, Richard III, and I had, to, I had to do armies, okay? And so we recruited the uh, uh, members of the fraternity, the incoming group. You know, they have they want to get in there for what they want to do. So we got them to be the military, right? So I needed how to do this. I had no budget. So I took old curtains and laid them on the ground and stamped them, cut, cut them down. I stapled them together. It worked. From the, from the audience, it looked like it was real. To make chain mail. I went to the, to the dining store and bought loose weaved dish claws, dipped them in silver paint and sewed them together. It looked like chain mail. So my model is do what works. Work with what you got. Other people don't think that way. I'm just trying to give you some examples and some insights. So if you want to do this, you have to understand the values and shares that are shared, the values that are shared by the people already of influence in your client group. What is it that they tend to defer to? What is it they tend to respect? We'll get into this later, because some of you have more control than others. Like if they want people who are six feet tall, then they can't, maybe you can't do that. But trust me, 
it takes more than one attribute. And that's what this is about. Okay, no single index is wholly accurate gauge of index. Be very careful. So you have to have multiple. So let's talk about what that means. If you have influence based on who you get access to, a measure of influence is who you have access to. There are some people, they know how to make a phone call, they know how to get through to people faster than anybody else. And guess what? They're listened and heard. So I, I just want you to be kind of aware of that. Um, the real measure, you have influence when you have access to people, access to information. Those are the ultimate measures of influence. Can you get them, okay? Do you get people's attention? Do they defer? Do they at least listen to you? Do they pay attention to something like that? Do they give deference to your ideas? They may not agree. I didn't say influence means everybody agrees. I said influence means people give deference. They hear it. They listen. They pay attention. Something like that. Okay? They also get better security and safety, greater financial reward. Now I'm going to talk about an example here. It's going to seem off the charts. One of my sons dated Tony Carter's eldest granddaughter. Who in the room knows who Tony Carter is? I'm glad. I'm glad. Tony Carter was the alleged head organized for arm for North America. We refer to him as Mafia. You know what happens when your son dates that person's eldest granddaughter? You don't want to go there, honey. Right? <laughs> so what I'm saying to you, uh, in terms of measuring who gets the elite, well, Tony Ocardo got access to people I can't get access to. I don't want access to. But you understand? You can do those kinds of things. Deference to ideas. What my son and I had a conversation, however, is that this is the girl you don't get pregnant. <laughs> this is the girl if you marry her, I'll support her, but you can't change your mind later. <laughs> <laughs> this is the girl if you marry her and she changes her mind really gracefully. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm, I'm just talking about, I'm trying to get you to understand what are the attributes or something like that. So they ended up having a very good friendship and monthly. That didn't happen. Okay, we're a good show. But uh, but it was very interesting. I kept saying that's a problem I don't need. Okay, I really don't need to have them as in-laws if you don't mind. Uh, I'm sure it would open doors. Maybe the doors I don't want open. Maybe the doors I don't want open that way. That's what I'm trying to do. So influence. You know if you have influence where you are. If people defer to you, you get access to people. You get access to information. You know where it is. That's, that's the ultimate measure. Now, <coughs> people have this influence. They usually, we look at this kind of stuff, they have wealth, and that gives them access to people information. I'm trying to talk about, I'm going to talk about sources of influence that I'd like for us to get there because we have skill and knowledge. I'd like us to get there because we're kind of nice to get along with, right? I'd like us to get there because we have a history of we bring stewardship over historic ideas, we know what's going on, or something like that. Okay, that's what I think. And here's, uh, well, anyway, let's go back here. I like for that is how I want us to get to the people who are making decisions, the people we need to do the thing. Here's another story for you. My brother uh, works, worked, he's retired now, for a large manufacturer. My brother's degree is in social this company only hires people with degrees in engineering. Got it? <coughs> Social work, engineering. Bad mix, right? Remember, that's only one value. He, he moved out to the Northwest, we call it Puget Sound, and he got a job, the only job he'd get, painting ceilings. Now you need to know, if this company makes large planes, you can figure out who it is, and a ceiling is not a casual thing. It's and they don't use brushes, they use hoses, they wear big gear. That's how they paint ceilings. <laughs> and he did that kind of work, right? And he had only been in the job like two months, not very long. And he read in the paper that this company was about to do something. So he's, he worked third shift. So he stayed over one morning and went to the president's office, still in his paint gear, still all of this stuff, 
and, and said, hi, uh, my name is Steve Hale, and I'm here to see the president. And the administrative assistant, you know, could clearly say, tell me more. <laughs> and he said, you know, I read in the paper about something we're doing, and if we're doing that, we're going to make a mistake. And I just wanted to go on record with that information. She got up, she saw, went in the president's office, and she came out, she said, he'll see you. So we went in the office. And he said, sir, if I, my information is wrong, just tell me I'm out of here, you're busy. But if my information is right, I just ask you to hear a few things. And he spelled out the story that the man never interrupted you. He told the whole story. He said, now, why should you believe me in terms of telling you wrong? Before I came to work here, I did similar work for the state of Ohio. I know this implications and gave his credentials. Thank you, sir. And left. The guy never said a word. My brother's career in that particular company sort of went like this. Now, what were the values that he demonstrated that superseded his lack of a degree in engineering? Caring, straight talk, taking the initiative, running the risk. Got it? Right. And he did very, very well. He managed facilities at the same time in Puget Sound, Hawaii, Oklahoma, Nova Scotia, Delaware, and Spain. Would you call that a fairly decent portfolio? Mm -hmm. I would. Why? He was always counting on, being <coughs> candid, talking straight, being polite. He's polite, right? Taking the risk, <coughs> reaching out, letting you know. So those values are examples of shares that just being an engineer won't get you in the door, you understand? So that's just an example. So I want you to think about what those are. Now here's something we have to look at. You get, when you get the most, when you get the shares, you get to manipulate the environment. Now this is a slide that I debate about always keeping in here, but people who really have a lot of influence decide who gets the resources. Don't you see that happening in companies? They decide how much money you get, they decide whether you've got staff, they decide whether or not, you know, where you get on the priority, the pecking rule, or something like that. If we can get influence, I'm not saying we do this at the expense of others, but we're in a better position to argue our cause for resources, money, and things like that. But the other thing they do is look at symbols and propaganda. I want you to pay attention to this. We see in the world people giving false information in order to paint a picture. I'm saying we can learn to use propaganda by using accurate information in order to paint a picture. I'm not asking us to lie. I'm telling us to learn to tell the truth. I'm talking about pointing out what really required for performance. Okay? I'm talking about the consequences of not investing in people. I'm talking about those things. We need to be smarter about packaging and perpetuating our own messages about ca uh, human capital investment. Okay, and what that's going to be. What are the implications when we don't do those things? I think we're too polite, too silent. And part of that's because we haven't learned how to exercise the influence we have. So, what I'm suggesting here is that we can learn to build our own power base. We can learn. We can identify those key characteristics that are values, and we can learn to see what we can associate. I'm going to give you some more examples. And we can gain deep knowledge about organizations. I, um, I won't take on a job unless I have an inside partner with deep knowledge of the organization. Because if I don't have that, my work will fail. It won't, it won't, has that, has that class in So I don't want you to ever belittle doing your homework about your own employer. Now I unfortunately meet people in HR in particular who feel it's unnecessary to do this. And I've asked them, I once met with an HR department, and I said, well, who's the company's major competitors? Nobody can answer. I said, well, what is their position in the marketplace? Nobody can answer. Well, we, we just deal with labor law, with you know, labor relations. Wrong. For those of us who are going to be in learning performance, and if you will, performance improvement, then we absolutely have to learn our client. We have to learn their their politics, their people, 
the players' competition where we only, we have to gain deep knowledge or something like that. So that's what I'm talking about, gain deep knowledge of the group's worldview. So here's a picture I created some time ago, which helps. This is what we do, internal or external. We are consultants. We contribute technical knowledge, we move people to action, we do these kinds of things. These are our enabling skills down here. Language, you know, those kinds of things. But this is the piece that gets us influence. It's the deep knowledge of the organization, which is why I will not take on Carnet unless I'm working with somebody inside of this. I, you know, they'll refer to me as an external. They'll be polite, they'll say it, and as soon as I'm gone, it's dead. There's no sustain. Won't work. So I absolutely have to have somebody on the inside who has this. So I just want you to think about this. I'm arguing that you need to really learn the company's history, the players, the politics. The, you know, you've got to learn that kind of stuff. You have to find out how we can do it. And we'll talk about how we can make it happen. This is the work based on Richard Bird. Uh, Richard Bird published a, a little book called Guide to Personal Risk Taking. It's, he's deceased. His book is out of print. Every now and then you can find one on Amazon for 37 cents plus postage. <laughs> and, but he was a mid-level manager. And he could never figure out why some managers in the company could break the rules and nobody got upset. Now, if you think, how many of you work internally here at companies? Okay, well, we're going to assume all of your people are on it. But, but think about, have you ever seen somebody that they can come in late on their budget? They, they, they can overspend their budget? That they just do, somehow they just don't walk the line? Something like that? He said, how is it? How is it that some people, income, anybody else does it, they're written up, they're called up, they're shunted, you know, they're ignored. They do, what, what is it about this people? And he, in his research, came up with a little test to be able to assess your own personal power in an organization. And he talked about these attributes. Now, you have it in your handout, you have a little test, but it's contextual. So your answers are different from the school system, are different from your religious institution, are different from your uh, social club, are different from your employer. They're not, the answers are not the same. So you have to first think of the context so his point is company friendships. People have influence if they built a lot of company friendships, but not just in their own department. We, they don't just have lunch with each other. I'm sorry. They go out and find <coughs> ways to do that. So my brother I was talking about, he always wanted to be designated to, to, for a whole year to work with United Way because he knew that would legitimize his opportunity to meet people in other parts of the business Legitimately, you gain access to it. You're not your way, right? So he did those kinds of things. Well, think about that. Personal company, desirable personal traits. Well, what are those? Okay. Well, again, if it's being six feet tall, there's maybe some limitations. But sometimes it's military experience. How about field experience? Some of us said, well, if you've never been in the field, you don't really know what it's about. Some organizations really prefer, or you have to be in sales. Have to have sales. I mean, it's like, okay, they're the little gods or whatever. So, but some organizations really defer to people with that kind of background, that kind of personal trait. Sometimes it's military background. We've all worn a uniform. Sometimes it's um, a being an engineer or a lawyer or a degree or something like that. Some of those are within our control, some are not. How about opportunity? I told you about my son and his dating the mafia's granddaughter. But opportunity, not too many of us get to marry the boss's son or daughter. But think about the opportunity you have if you did. You'd be able to sit down with the boss on Sunday dinners. You would hear a conversation that nobody else had access to, right? So what is this opportunity? Opportunity is the opportunity to get to be known as a person who says what they mean, what they says, to what they promises. And I will tell you that this chapter is huge in opportunity. Being active in chapters is a chance for people to see you safely. They get to hear you and see if you make sense. If you volunteer, they find out if you deliver. 
It's a wonderful opportunity to be known in a safe arena. That's essential for people to consider for hiring, whether it be a consultant or internally, or for getting access to other people. So I will just tell you, I think it's huge. Uh, perceived expertise. I didn't say expertise. I said perceived expertise. I mean, there's some people we think are smart who are. I'm sorry. <laughs> smart, but somehow it gets discounted. <clears throat> so where does perceived expertise come from? Perceived expertise comes from little things like publishing, speaking, writing for your little newsletter, putting little pieces out, whether that be internally or externally. Perceived expertise comes from taking on some leadership positions. Again, it can be a social service group, religious group, professional group, something like that. Pretty soon people think you must know what you're talking about. So perceived expertise is whether people think you know what you're talking about. By the way, there should be an after effect, like as you do, you should start learning. That helps a little bit. <laughs> Information. There's a great deal of influence that comes from just being in the know. One of the problems we have in learning is that we tend to say that we're at the bottom of the information chain. Remember, all the other decisions make them really tell us that not only. How do we get up earlier in the information chain? Well, that you do it through those friendships. If you meet the right people, you go have coffee or something like that, you see them, what's going on, you get inside information faster about what's going on with people. This is huge. It's about information. And how do we get it? Yes, you should read, but I'm talking about information that's rarely documented. I'm talking about what people are thinking about and what's going on. By the way, one of the assignments I had, I skipped this, I did it for a number of years. I'm in Chicago, and one of the corporate, corporate homes is there. And I used to get a call from the administrative assistant of one of the senior executives. And she used to call me and said, we have a bag of books. We want you to read them and tell us what's in them. So I'd go over and pick up 12 or 15 books. These people didn't have time to read them or read because they wanted to be in the know. <laughs> <laughs> so I would do... I'm really good at reading, so I'd be reading, I'd say, this book has one good point, it's on this page, this book has two good points, and I would say, this book is useless, you know, and I'd rather do that. The side effect was, guess what I got? I got to read all kinds of books at no cost, or something like that. And guess what I also got? My opinion mattered to senior executives. We defer to her to do an assignment. And once they learned that I was real straight with them, once they learned that I covered the, the critical point that they needed to do, and they tested that out in their network, guess what happened? I got more books. <laughs> <laughs> Personal confidence. Now, this is not about arrogance, but I'm sorry, it's, it's, it's feeling a lot of confidence that you know what you're talking about, you know where you're going, it, it's being comfortable with yourself. And that's something that you don't have to get therapy. But, you know, <laughs> it's something that you need to work on. Don't have confidence in work, figure it out, or something like that. There's some areas I'm clearly I lack confidence. You know what? Because I know I'm done with that. But I'm smart enough to partner with people who are smarter than me. And so I don't try to do this. I have a network of people and that I've worked with through ISPI over the years that if I really want to be in the know, I can call them and trust that I will get the best information. Because those people read all the time. The read research that the rest of us can never get our hands on. They're huge to me. So I don't try to replace them. I try to work with them and I make them feel good. I give them compliments. I do everything I can. Do you understand? But I know I can't do that. Technology is, I'm a little technologically challenged or something like that. So uh, I actually try to partner with people who can explain what plugs into what and who cares. And I say things when I, I'm terrible. I say, there's holes in the back of the, those reports. <laughs> <laughs> Status depends upon the context. Um, some organizations give status to people because they have a PhD, uh, because they've been there a long time, uh, because they're married to the right person, so like that. So you have to ask yourself what the status comes from. It's very unique to the context. Something like that. And sometimes just because a person has status doesn't mean they really know. But you have to pay attention to those things. How do you get perceived? If you, if you can't handle that one, there are some things. Company friendships, something you can work on. 
perceived expertise, opportunity you can create yourself. You can pay attention to committees and things like that. Information, you can figure out who has it and build relationships with those people. Seniority is also unique. Some companies really value people who are long timers, long termers. Other companies worry about you because you don't do it every 18 months. They think you has been. So you have to, that's unique again to the context. Particularly in the high tech industry, they really worry if you stay in a job too long. You must be brain dead or something. But other places, you better be there for a long time. And then finally, interpersonal skills. There's something to be said. I, um, I was talking to the Emily Post people. Um, Emily Post is their, you know, this is really old school. Em Emily Post right now, their business is booming, just booming, because people don't know how to do basic manners. They really don't know how to do basic stuff. And as we work internationally and things like that, they're very out of they're out of their element and what they can do. So they're I went and bought all the coach books, right? So and I'm reading, I'm going through them. And it's just like, how do I do that? Because I'm now traveling more for SPI, traveling internationally. I don't need to offend people. That isn't how we start. You know, it's, you know I don't need to offend them. My immediate neighbors next door are Muslim. And I, I called the house of them one day. By the way, on my fax machine came uh, uh, architectural drawings for a mosque. Okay, well they just gave them my fax number because they didn't have a the fax. They just failed to mention this to me, okay? <laughs> so I get architectural drawings for a mosque. I know they're not for me. So I call my Muslim neighbors and the little boy says, Daddy's at prayers, okay? So I see him out on the yard, and I said, excuse me, I like to call you, but would you do prayers? I can avoid that. He said, call whenever you want. I said, no, no, no. Tell me the time to avoid. He said, Judy, the times change every day. Call when you want. Okay. So I invited them to dinner, and I called up, and I said, I'd like to have you for dinner. What are your dietary restrictions? And they said, pork and blood. <laughs> I don't want you, I've never served blood before. <laughs> <laughs> so I had to say, talk to me about how that shows up. Undercooked meat. All meat must be well done. No pink anywhere. Okay? Most of us call that shoe leather. I mean, I'm into some of the medium rare. Mm-mm, That's blood. Got it? <laughs> so, fine. I can, I'm just trying to give you an example here. All I'm trying to say is interpersonal skills. We can practice, and I have to say, because I'm hearing impaired, I don't always get some names, particularly names that have lots of vowels and stuff like that, and I have to work very hard at them. And I say, this is difficult for me. You know, how do I work with you? I'm trying to admit, I don't know. All right. So why don't we, I mean, so there's some things here that I just ask, because those are within our control. Right. We can go to the library, look up Emily Post, and see how you work with people. Okay, um, this is the little test that you get, and I ask you the context, and what you do is you give your score, saying I don't have any of that, or I have a lot. It's only zero to three. There's nine questions. The highest score you get is 27 points. Okay, nine points are 27. So what's this got to do with Richard Bird? Richard Bird, his stuff, he learned that people, the people who score closer to 27, can take more risks in the organization. They can speak out. They can challenge the status quo. They can ask for more time. They can get more money. Okay. The closer you are to zero, shut up and behave. Okay. Don't mess with it. Well, what about the middle? What he learned is if you score somewhere in the middle, you can take risks if you have the support of your peers. You cannot do it without that. So that means you have to say, are you really going to stand with me or not? So just think about those two All right. There is another power source. We heard this gentleman, uh, it was a couple years ago. He, Mr. Pepper, spoke at our conference, and he talked about the power of engagement. Now, we all heard about engagement, we got them by Harry because we don't invite Harry and stuff. That's not what Pepper's talking about. Pepper's is talking about engagement is genuine, genuine interest and in involving other people. 
genuinely seeking out their opinions. Genuine, that's the key. So engagement's not like, well, you know, we have to invite them because we have to bring them in here because we don't. No, no. It's saying we're going to bring them in here because we need to hear the position. We need to hear what they're doing and what's been. I'm interested in really doing those particular things. Um, I'm doing, um, with the ISP, I'm doing a lot of work right now with the state of Georgia. And the state of Georgia, uh, depending upon whether or not you count Alabama, rates either 48 or 49 in terms of public education. They're near the bottom. And they're trying very hard to turn that around. And we, they have, so they're just doing some remarkable work. We've got 16 success case studies. I mean, we're really doing some remarkable work. Engagement is key. They find the people that everybody's written on and they make sure they genuinely hear them and engage them and involve them. And guess what? They're improving kids' test scores, teacher performance, principal performance, and superintendent performance. They're doing some really wonderful work. And part of it was they are an inclusive model. Most of us start out saying, what would you get ahead of if you just murder Harry? Right? No, you're not going to murder anybody. So we try to write them off, we isolate them, Lock them up, not involve them. No. What they're doing is involving all of those people. But it's a genuine seeking out their opinions. Okay. Rule number two. Rule number one is remember it's increased power. Rule number two has to do with stay out in front, but not too far. Now I'm hoping this resonates with our cameraman over here, because he and I, I'll talk about this, he and I are frequently more out front more than inside. So we have some problems here. It's aspire to have the attributes. We want to share history, education. We want to be on the edge of moderate risk paper. This is what it looks like. People are leaders and influences if they're on the edge. But I want you to point out they're on the inside, not on the outside. Okay? Most of my career at ISPI, I've been out there. Okay? I have not, I don't share a lot of the attributes of many of the leaders. Well, I'm, I, I'm not behaviorist. Okay, I didn't, I appreciate Skinner, but you know, I'm more than that. I, I didn't come in from a military background, I said that already. There's some other things like that. So, so I have been seeing more out here, whoops, I can see more out here than I have been, which is what I really want, is to be seen here. And I've been working very hard to be seen as somebody who's on the edge driving rather than outside pulling. Now, the reason I mentioned Guy is because I think Guy is another one that walks that fine line. There are times that he's more out than in, right? And he there finds himself pulling more than leading. So we, I only point that out. You, you, leaders take risks. People with influence take risks. But you can't be so different that they write you off. Then you will take risks and you'll be all by yourself. No one will be there for you. Okay. The, another rule has to do with not getting grilled. Well, this is based on the research um, we have it here. It's McCall and Lombardo. Talk about it. Uh, they did some interesting research about why is it people come in, we hire them, they build all the right attributes, they have a background, they have a good place, and they screw up. They get in trouble. And I think there's something you learn. These are non examples of how not to do that. I did talk to an executive once. He said, I wish. I know this earlier because I've already, I've already screwed up 20 times. It's an interesting model because the research says you don't screw up twice. You screw up two areas, you're dead meat. Very unkind model. In the world of business, we are not tolerant. Okay? And this gentleman, he said, I wish I had known this. Okay, so what are those factors? These are the, what we call the fatal flaws based on what Colorado's research. Okay? You have trouble with, you, and the, the research says you have two, you're dead, okay? You're, you're going to be, you may not be fired, but you've lost all your influence. People will not hear you. They, you, they will discount your opinion. They will look around you. They'll do those kinds of things. We'll look at some of these, insensitivity to others. We just said the other one, power base was in a personal skills, didn't we? So there are people that get ahead, they're very insensitive, and they bring, they leave dead bodies behind them. The point is the dead bodies wait eventually get even. Mm -hmm. it, 
is amazing watching how people get even in time. They become incredibly passive aggressive, or what I call, they do selective pollution. They tell you, they tell you enough of the story, and you think you've got the whole story, you go out and make an A double S of yourself. Okay? So, cold, aloof, arrogant, betrayed trust, we'll talk more about that later. Overmanaged, this is called micromanaging, something like that. Overly ambitious. They don't seem to get a job and they're always looking for the next job. They're always doing this job while they're always doing the next job. And I know people that are always looking for the next job, the next job, the next job. And they never stay in this job enough to do anything. And by the time it's figured out they don't do anything, they're on bringing in the next job. And their, their resume looks unreal or something like that. Failed to staff effectively, I look at that. Unable to think strategically. Unable to adapt to a new boss. I've been all of us have been in times where we had a new boss. Where did this, where did we get this turkey? You know, how do we get this person? We have to do it. Well, the point is we have to learn to adapt. We actually have to help learn to make them successful. This one's an interesting, over depending on the advocate and the People open the doors for you, and they, it's, but you can't rely on them forever. You have to build your own reputation, you have to build your own place, you have to build your own position. You cannot rest on the coattails. You're still with me? Mm -hmm. You haven't asked any question. <laughs> okay. All right. So, what McCall and Barlow found out is, so standards of influence versus short-term power. We all see people short-term power. <clears throat> These people have a greater diversity of work experience. So, that means you don't just stay in marketing. You try and build, whether somehow you've got to learn something about operations. You've got to learn something about the other things. You build some other broader expertise. Those of us in learning development, it's nice of us to concentrate in one area, but we need to build some other repertoire, whether that be electronic media, whether that be onboarding, or whether that be technical skills. We need to do those kinds of things. How about composed under stress? I'll give you a tip. When things really get crappy for me, I go home and clean a drawer. I've at least got one part of my life that's neat. Okay. <laughs> I don't take it out on anybody else. I do that with them. When it, and I can tell you, when I'm off the charts, I go home, I look, and I clean the drawer. It's very safe. I can't hurt anybody. I can even throw the stuff on the floor. Who cares? So part of this is composure under stress. You don't do yourself or anybody else. But it's, it's being aware of your, when you're close to the edge yourself. We all get exhausted. We all get disappointed. We all get hurt. But how do we protect ourselves and do that? The other thing is having a very good support network, people you can trust. I call people up and say, at the end of this conversation, you know we've forgotten everything I said. And they know what that means. I'm going to bitch and moan and say, thank you very much, and hang up. I don't want them to fix it. I want them to forget it. They can even, they can even go do something else. I don't care. That's having a support network for what you trust to do. All right? Handle mistakes under points. If you screw up, apologize. Do it fast. Focus on problems and solve them. Okay? These, this is, you know, what are we trying to accomplish? What, is, what are we trying to do? It's really looking at the results we're doing. Gets along with all kinds of people. Outspoken, but not against. I grew up in, uh, well, I grew up starting out in central middle town Ohio. And then, uh, later on, I moved to Alexandria, Virginia. And in many ways, I had a very sheltered kind of upbringing. Uh, I lived with people who looked like me, acted like me, and all that kind of stuff. My family, everybody had complete families, and all that kind of stuff. It wasn't until I started teaching college in Chicago that I was exposed to people of different religions, different backgrounds, and something like that. Now, at least I tried not to offend anybody. You know, I tried to learn from that. And I try to work from that, and I keep doing it. But I know, I at least, we can be very insulated. We have to, if we get along this world, we've got to learn to work with people who are very different than ourselves. That doesn't mean you have to like them. I mean, you have to learn to get along with them. You have to work with them in that sense or something like that. It makes a difference. That way. Okay, so that's just some thoughts. This is in within our power. This is another thing that's within the power. This comes from the work of the Vanguard Consulting Group, you know, as Don Toasty and Stephanie Jackson. They did some really good work about how do you build trust? 
How do you really build trust in the I, I, I like it. First of all, uh, we trust people. You know, respect is high regard for expertise, insight, experience, people who bring those kinds of things. It's synonymous with like dependability. That's where the chapter is so important. It's a chance to build a sense of trust. Dependability. Say what you mean. Mean what you say. Show up. Deliver. Right? It has to do with predictability. You know where the truth is going to come from, where she's going to be. Consistency. Reliability. Okay. Have you ever met people who are Johnny come lately, so never can be there, or it's only when it's convenient? That's not the reputation we want. We want to build influence as learning and, perf and performance professionals. We have to earn people's trust. And that comes from being just those particular things. Another way of looking at it, it arose with these kinds of things. We can't play the dirty politics. It will bite us. It will hurt us bad. Okay? We can't deal with those guys. Lack of, you know, we cannot, we have to be very, very careful on some of those things. And it's easy to get sucked in to organizations, what I call the dirty politics, playing one group against the other, keeping deferring information. We can't do this particular So we have to learn to be open, accessible, maintain confidences, deliver. That's what it's all about. Now, rule number five has to do with sustainability. And the other work, the reason we're having success in Georgia has to do with sustainability. We can always get people to change behavior short term, but getting them to stick with it long term is the issue. Have you ever tried losing weight? Have you ever tried promising to go to the gym to work out? You know, some people just do it. I'm not one. Okay? I have a lot of trouble in these particular areas. So what I'm talking about, sustainability, is, is really understanding how we keep an eye doing, how we keep things going. The critical mass. We have to be smarter about looking at our line managers, our internal customers, external customers, the work group, and you have to understand we have to get to critical mass. If you can't turn the corner, mathematically it's 51%, but it's really it's the people with both influence. I've got a slide that will explain it a bit better. But I keep saying not, you have to look at people in a strategic line. If you can't get to the critical mass, you can't turn the ship. You can't keep it afloat. You cannot sustain it. So, those of you in learning and performance internally, you have to say, how many internal customers do we have? And I will tell you, you need to strategically say, how many of those do you need to build relationships with? You don't have to want to say. Japanese. One of those Japanese firms that are really good at what they do, um, I went to their learning performance group, and they have a wall that has the little photographs, called photographs, of every line manager in the entire hierarchical in every line. Just, and it's their private room. And every time they want to go out and launch something, they go on stage and say, okay, who's going to support us? Who's going to be against us? Okay, if he's going to be against us, how do we influence him? Who do we draw on? And they look for the critical mass to turn it. Because if they get enough people to support it, it will stay. But if you get one or two adopters, and that's all, it will not last. Okay. So this is look for that critical mass. We have to have some quick successes. We can't keep saying trust us in time it will be good. Trust us in time a miracle will happen. No, we have to deliver some we have to deliver some quick success. Uh, I say whenever we're doing something internally, we need the line organization to have oversight. We need the line organization to own this. As long as it's ours, it will always be ours. So if we really want an organization to embrace investing in human capital, embrace really investing in people, really growing capability, it can't be our assignment. It has to be the learning organization. Okay, we have to be much smarter about communicating gains. So maybe we need the Twitter stuff that Guy is pushing out, maybe we get on Facebook. But we need to find the avenues to constantly just not once, something like that. And I think we have to learn to share the glory. It's not about us, it's about them. We have to share that. So, my last rule is, is that when there are changes are happening, okay, old relationships, 
will prevail over data. I'm sorry. We have an illusion in this country that decisions are based on data. Decisions are made based on relationships. Preserving relationships, not putting over relationships. So if we think our numbers are going to sway, you have to be very careful. Executives will rarely ever go against old friendships because they trust it. And they will even preserve old friendships when they are no longer. So, political skill is calculating the problem changes in influence under change conditions. It's recognizing the change in landscape. I was uh, sharing uh, today, this afternoon, with a group. There's an organization, a learning and a performance group, that was a high performing group. They were absolutely wonderful. They did excellent work at this time. But they failed to notice a change in the landscape. The clients that they had built tremendous trust and had gained access to were retired. And they were being replaced by a young group who had MBAs and knew and couldn't be bothered. All right? So they were a group that was in a strategic position. They were at the table. They were doing that. And all of a sudden, they were not at the table because the critical mass turned the other way. They had all these young MBAs who said, your staff, shut up to what you're told. All of a sudden, they became order tables. So what I want you to understand here is you better watch your landscape. If you've built good relationships, you have to build a succession plan as well. You have to build new people from you. The people you trust, the people who trust you, will retire. Sorry. Or they'll win the lottery and leave. <laughs> okay? So watch those things. So you have to constantly adjust. So with that, Let's look at this little, this is that critical mass part. If you want to do something, like you want to put programs in a box for chapters, right? You need to find out who's supporting you, and you really need to get them involved as best you can. And you need to find out who isn't. And if they're influential, you at least need to hear them out so they don't feel discounted and dismissed. If you have people support you but nobody cares about them, you want to make them more influential. But here's the group over here. You want to stay polite or they become like bad souls. They'll hurt you. So you have to think, sometimes just doing good work by itself is not enough. That's all I'm saying. We have to find the people we have to look at on this. All right? So clarify the measure result you want. Identify the valid behaviors. Use multiple sources of influence. Find the positive view. That's the person who will tell you to take risks. That's fine. And that's my references. So, do you have any questions yet? Comments? Yes, sir. Yeah, I have a comment on, uh, I think it was number four, the transparency. And what I find interesting, especially these days, is how you mentioned Twitter and Facebook and social media, how even today transparency is so important for every business and it is expedited now. Oh, so many, I mean, Mr. Tiger Woods has his world turned upside down rapidly. And uh, I think that now um, being forthcoming and doing good work and, and fighting the good fight. It's really the only way you can do it. Because if you're, if it's a sham, it's going to be it exposed. It will be found out. Won't it? Yeah. It will be found out, and it can be devastating. Absolutely. I was talking to some friends about give me the Tiger Woods issue, and I said, how could somebody, <coughs> how could you do that? And all three of the guys said, it's a guy thing. I mean, you know, he has a beautiful family. He's very famous. He's highly regarded, and he betrayed some major trusts. Yeah. It's going to be interesting. Let's, there was another hand back here. Still behind you. Yes. Earlier this evening, we were talking about networking. Earlier this evening, we were talking about networking. Networking <coughs> is part of that genuine engagement, Dick. When we're going to network, net, a lot of people think they're networking like once a year to go out and see something. This kind of influence is not built in casual encounters. It's not based on just periodically handing out a business card. 
I mean, it's investing in building a sense of presence. I go to an incredible number of meetings. I get 100 plus emails a day. I try very hard to answer them, or I'll write you back and say, if you don't hear from me in two weeks, ring my chimes again. I'll get back to you, okay? Something like that. So that networking is, is, is not a bad, it's, it's being known and it's learning who you are. It's trying to say, you know, I know, I've met her before, we've been here before. It's building that relationship. Now maybe I won't get to North Carolina once in a couple years, but it's connecting with people. So networking is, I think, we tend to think we'll just, you know, we need a job, so we'll suddenly join. Now we come in and we will hand out business cards or something like that. We think we network. No, you haven't. You've handed out business cards. Don't confuse the two. Okay? Networking is coming and getting to know people, learning about them, getting them to help know you, find out what's unique about them. It's investing in relationships today. That's what networking is all about. And Dick and I were talking about that. He was gracious enough to pick me up. This is a down economy. This business is going well. I got more business than I have to do with it. Right? And I like to think it's because people can trust me. They see me in safe environments. We like the way she talks. We like, and if they don't, they're not going to hire me anyway. So those are kinds of, that's what networking is about. There's another hand back here. Yes. I was just going to ask if there's a particular reference you might recommend more, more than the others. The references? Uh, oh, did I just do that? Okay. Here's, uh, this, this work here, Patterson, I don't recommend it. This is about the ugly side of politics. I want to put him up here because if you really want to know how not to do it, this is a called gouging, uh, manipulating, and things like that. I happen to think one of the things I really like is if you get a hold of Bird's little book, I would do that. I'll tell you Hawkins' book, The Ecology of Commerce, Chapter 9, The Opportunity of Insignificance. You only have to read one chapter. <laughs> I think his little book is really great. I take you to the library and get it or something like that. The McCall Lombardo stuff is a paper research, maybe you can still find it. I still think their stuff is, is absolutely solid. Schwartz, The Art of the Long View, he's the guy who really does a lot of forecasting. His book I take you to the library. Is that helping you a little bit? Mm -hmm. Yes, thank you. You don't have to read all of them. Last well is the one that I, I'm referring to. He's the one, his work is dry as dark, but very good, very good. He really talks about the psychopathology in politics. And this little book, Politics, Who Gets What, When, and How? That's a little book that is very, very insightful in how it's <coughs> But these books are all out of print. I, I looked all over for stuff, and that's what I can do. Who asked about the questions or comments? Yes? My question is, you, you talked about um, one of the attributes of earning respect, I guess, is, is having deep expertise, but also talked about trying or having a diversity of work experience. Right. So if you're trying something new and you don't have that deep expertise, do you have advice on how to become an influencer quickly? Call uh, yourself consultant. I, <laughs> <laughs> I, I think that is a real serious point. <coughs> There's some things I simply don't have deep expertise in, and guess what? I don't want it. Okay? I, so what I'm going to try and do is find people who have it. So when I need them, I can draw on that particular stuff. There's just some stuff. I just don't want to go there. So I will also tell you that the, the diversity of experience, I, don't, I think it's understanding the key parts of the business and getting some experience there, but then coming back to the core that you want to have deep experience in. Because you don't go to any job and get deep knowledge in like a year, or year and a half. You get introduced to some stuff. And hopefully you can do the networking and build some good relationships. And then maybe you know who you can trust there. So when you come back to your board, you know who you But I don't think it's about uh, learning to be the best or having deep knowledge. We don't live on that. And I'll tell you quite honestly, there's some stuff I don't want to know. So, don't do How about somebody else? Yes? Just, you know, we now have four generations in the workplace. And, and you mentioned rule six, decisions are based on relationships, not data. Now you know that the younger generations, why <coughs> it's all about data. How do you get them on board with the politics of performance? 
but they're not turned off by the relationships that might get in the way. Her, her point is about generational differences. The Canadian Conference Board, I tell you to check them out, the Canadian Conference Board does some of the nicest research. I've ever seen this. And they came back with some generational research and found out we're more likely to be So they came back and, I mean, they're really challenging some of these, these particular things. And what are we, people, no matter what generation, I think everybody wants to feel genuine and respected. They want to have people around them that they can trust. So, so but, they, but the conference board did some really interesting research, which it's the Canadian Conference Board, I think, we part of it online, and, but they really talked about this, we're more alike than we are different. Now, I will tell you that some of the kids, the, I'm on now, some of the kids, they have, you know, if they've had parents that were never there, they're not trying not to do that. They're trying, they're insisting on maybe more balanced lifestyle, they're not willing to do those particular things. What I also see are the ones, if you want me to learn, you gotta pay me. I won't do it unless you pay me. Well, they can choose to stay stupid. There will be consequences to that. I'm sorry. So they're just too naive to figure that out. If, if we don't invest in our own learning, if you're only gonna learn if the boss pays for it, you've just chosen to stay stupid. And that's what we're gonna remember. So I, I, want, want, I was talking to one person that, the, that my company won't pay for any professional development. Honey, we have a library. I mean, come on, you know? What's the issue here? I have a very good colleague that not only has she a library card, she goes there every week. And she has her kids going there and they're checking out books and reading so that she doesn't have to stay stupid. Workshops are not the only way to learn. I wonder how many people here spent their own fifteen dollars to come here tonight. How many people here spent their own fifteen dollars to come here? Look at that. Right. See, there that, you go. Right. That's in the same thing yourself. And I think it's absolutely essential. So some young people don't want to do that. Well, you know what? They're gonna find out the consequences to that. Sorry. Yes. Um, when you talked about the fatal flaws. What do you do if you work in a department where the other people in the department have committed on the solid things and you haven't, and so you're trying to have influence, but also when you get influence, um, they resent you for that. So when you have those kinds of politics going on in your organization, you have to make some decisions about who you're trying to influence, okay? Maybe they're not the right audience. Some, and they can resent you because maybe you are building credibility with a different group or something like that. And you're going to find a group like that. They will not like you. So you have to ask yourself, this comes back to one of a problem with association. So I, I, I'd like to make it easy for you, but I don't have an easy answer for that. So I keep saying there's some people I don't care to influence them. I don't respect them. I'll just be polite. I'm practicing my own process. Yes, was there anything back here? Yeah. All right. Well, um, we have some time. Uh, why don't you turn to a neighbor? I don't care if it's triads or something like that. And I'd like for you to talk about, based on what we've heard tonight, what are our takeaways? What can we apply in our own life? Go for it. I want you to.
like to share or do I have to call on you? <laughs> Boy, you really got into it. Can they hear that energy? Man, it's awesome. So, I'd like to share with a large group. I keep a secret. Yes. <laughs> um, you know, lots of times when I talk to people about performance consulting, um, training people will say, well, you know, I really don't have the power in my organization to do that. I can't, I can't do that. They just want me to take an order and, okay, that is true, but given what you've researched about politics, how does one get that kind of influence over time? Oh, you're asking the question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, I hope you're listening. Does, you know, they want you to do something like that. I usually start out by saying, it's, it's evident to me that you've given a lot of thought to this. But, so I don't waste your time and I don't waste your money. Share with me how you got here. Then I'll be more likely to meet what your intent is. Getting them to articulate, articulate their logic or something like that, they will come to understand how weak it is. But if you can also listen to the intent, not the per, not the prescription. So they will say to you, well, I want to, it used to be a videotape, now I want a, a webinar, now I have to do that kind of stuff. And if you try and listen to, in that, getting them to share the logic, you're really looking for the intent. What was the power, what was the problem that they were trying to alleviate and solve? If you can get to the intent, then you're, one, they will feel heard, and two, then you're in a better position to say, I think I can help you on your intent, and this is what you're trying to accomplish. Are you open to maybe some other ways that I think will be more effective? But they won't be open until they feel heard. No one's going to, so, you, so part of that is I, I actually say, you know, clearly you've given this a lot of thought, knowing full well that you've given it none. That's a side point. <laughs> and I say, because I don't want to waste your time, I don't want to waste your money. Share with me how you got here. What are you seeing? What are you not seeing? What do you want to have different? Because then I'm in a better position to make sure that what you want done works. Then I guess, so the real goal here is something else. The goal is not a webinar. I have one of my best examples is I was called in to develop, um, to develop a webinar. Now, those of you who know me, you never ask me to do a webinar. You never spell it. So that was hired, they called me to do a webinar. They wanted to train executives how to motivate. And it, they told me it was going to be compulsive. It's going to be a 90 minute webinar on how to motivate people, and we're going to make everybody in the executive suite from the president down come. And I said, Well, this is going to be a hot day webinar. <laughs> <laughs> and so, if I'm going to have that audience and they're going to be required to come, then I need to have, I don't want to embarrass anybody. That has to be so perfect. I need to talk to a couple. Can I name whoever you want? It was, it was actually over a hundred of them. And I said, pick, pick 12. I want to interview them. Just let me talk to them. They call me at their convenience, two in the morning, I don't care. <coughs> and they did, they called, and I was allowed to do that, and I heard them. And what was interesting is that they all said the same thing. They said, uh, we're never allowed to turn our cell phones off. Uh, everyone has to know everything, so everybody's copied on everybody's voicemail. So you come to work and have six hours of voicemail. Uh, everybody had, you would have, you know, like hundreds of emails because everybody had to be copy them everybody. Because everybody had to know anything about anything. Well, as a result, nobody knew anything about anything. That's right. <laughs> so, but, you know, it was talking like that. Then, and I, I kept, you know, nobody had a backup. So if you ever, if, if Charlotte said, you know, uh, one of my people were working at a project that was a ding for her, why don't you know about it? Well, it's growing your backup. So growing your backup was, why, nobody took vacation. Well, I can't, I didn't. I, they told me they would call meetings at 6.30 Sunday morning, okay? They did. Now, I will also tell you that some of them were on their seventh wife and some of them. <laughs> so, and one of them told me his wife sends him pictures of the children so he knows them if he sees them. Okay. Okay. So, so family values were not here. Don't get over that. But, but, I, but all, everyone I interviewed told me the same story. Same thing. Well, that's got to show up somewhere. So, I asked to interview the medical director. I found out that two of their peers had committed suicide at the office and they failed to mention that. Don't you think <coughs> if you came to work and one of your colleagues killed himself, you would notice? 
You were, they, I found it interesting, you were silent. I found out that their, their insurance rates are, are going off the charts because of premature disability due to stress, that uh, their health claims are off the charts, that uh, uh, a turnover of key personnel, as soon as they get out, they're getting out. I found out that people are absent, late, huge ramifications. So then I talked to HR on some of the other things, and I found out some of the other stuff. Well, with that, I'm still working on the webinar, knowing full weather, never going to get a webinar. But that's what you tell me. Okay? So I'm just trying to talk to her. This is a true story, today, okay? So then I came back and I started reporting. I said I went to the learning and group who didn't know how to handle this. I said, okay, we're going to have a working session. I want you to bring 12 of them in for four hours, and we're going to do this. So I brought them in, 12 of them, pulled at random. And I gave them data about the consequences of their behavior. No one had ever told them this. No one had ever told them what the real turnover is, what insurance rates were. Nobody ever, I just put that out. And I said, oh, I also reported what the people I interviewed told me. And nobody disagreed, which told me it was pretty true, right? So next, I said, OK, if, are these numbers what you want? No. I said, well, then let's work on it. And I took the risk and developed straw model protocols, like how to run a meeting. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I mean, come on, this is called management 101. If this is remedial management, how, how to have man, how to run a meeting, who to call, how to set agendas. We also talked about a draft of protocols, who gets copied, something like that. I wrote protocols about vacations. Uh, time off, uh, anywhere between 12 sets of protocols. And I got them to edit, everyone will edit, no one will ever put anything in. So you give them a, a big marker, and everybody can criticize your work. And as a result, we got a pretty decent product. So I, I turned to the learning group, I said, let's bring in the next 12. And they said, we're not getting a webinar, are we? <laughs> <laughs> I said, this is the work. This is substituting for the webinar. Okay, so we did, and we got up over every 100 of them, we brought them in. Oh, by the way, at the end of their session, I made everyone do the same exercise. They, made, they heard what they all said, they heard the consequences, they worked on the protocols, and the next thing they all had to do was, what are we going to do when we regress to old behaviors? Not, what are we going to do if we regress? <coughs> it's like, what are we going to do when we regress? I wanted them to hold each other accountable for what they were doing, committing to do. And they agreed to report on their own behavior every month. And we're still sustaining. Okay? That's what's happening. So part of that, what, what, what's that about influence? It was taking the risk to put some work to let them criticize it. It was giving them information that we thought they had, but no one had ever put it that explicitly. It was agreeing to do it, but wanting to clarify it. But I was not going to run out. Do you really think that a webinar would have mattered? Mm -hmm. They would have sat there and read their email during the webinar or listened to their voicemail, right? They wouldn't have paid attention. And if that important, there's a book out. It's a hundred more, a thousand more ways to motivate people. We could have just bought a book. We said it after the day, right? We said, we have a book report, have a book club, something like that. But so, if you want to have power and influence, I'm going to tell you, honor the request, convince people you heard them, look for the intent behind the message, negotiate for getting more data, be sure to get talk straight, and move them to the real result that they want. Does that help you? There was another hand up. Sorry. Well, yeah. I, I just talked about uh, looking at material, the whole piece of noticing when the environment changes. That can be very discouraging. It can be very discouraging because notice when the environment changes. We see people that we care and have built relationships with, they're retiring, they're getting ill. Uh, that's one of the things we're finding in ISPI because I run this certification program. I can't tell you how many of my uh, CPTs that are facing major health crises. It's, it's very real. But you have to, you can't be naive about it. 
new people are coming in with, you know, that look at things differently. And how do we work with that? There were some other hands. Sharon, yes. Uh, we talked in part about, uh, I'm an external person, so we talked in part about the difficulty, or, or should say the longer period of time it takes to establish trust inside of an organization that isn't your own and where you are not present every day. Kind well, of lengthening the sales cycle, it seems, these days. It's a huge sales cycle in terms of that, but I would tell you this is why you have to find avenues to be seen to build that trust. I just talked recently to an um, external consultant who's who used to earn six figures and did very, very well, and all of a sudden his work went kaputi because he wasn't tracking or something like that. And I said, well, how did you get started? He said, well, I work with this society. Oh, so it's not Isaac He was a consultant in engineering. He said, I used to work with him. I said, well, he said, and he just stopped. He said, I, I haven't been back to him in 10 years. I need to go back to my roots. So he, he cut off. He was living so high and doing so well that he wasn't building his pipeline. So that's how you do it. You get new people, you build that pipeline, you build the trust, so when new things come in, you will lose your customers. You will lose them. So what's your pipeline? And if you have a sales cycle, I know I, I made some strategic decisions uh, when I started my own company. Uh, what, to be honest with you, they were ignorant decisions. That just made sense to me. They were not based on any data. But one of them was that I would never get in bed with one customer. I would never allow one customer to take all my time. I will not do that because that relationship will end. I didn't say if. I said that relationship will end. And if I am in bed with just one customer, if they're getting all my time, I have not built the network. I've not built the relationships to carry it forward. So I will not ever do exclusive work. Oh, I might, you might get me for a week, but you're not going to get me for six months. If you want me for six months, I'm going to negotiate time to do other things. I learned that a long time ago. The other thing is I don't concentrate on the industry. I concentrate on working with people whose values I can resonate with. So they cross those things. But those are some key decisions. We have a new independent group. Uh, we have uh, ISPI, we have a new team of uh, independent consultants. And some of them are very successful about our learnings and how it got started. And we talk about the importance of networking. Yes, Guy. Can you tell us a little bit about this thing, CPT? What's that all about? The CPT is a certification offered by ISPI. How many here know SHRM and know the senior profession? Okay. It's the counterpart of that, but more performance improved. And um, it's for people. There, there's some attributes about uh, performance improvement. I call it human performance technology, and one is that we're very skilled in handling ill-structured problems. So a webinar to get executives to, that's an ill-structured problem. All of you, the, the, sometimes a problem comes in, but it looks simple in service. Trust me, it ain't. So there, there is much deeper, much more complex. So I think we bring some skill who, for doing those kinds of things. We also get certified because we're really focused on results, not necessarily training 125 people, but working on the miracle we think is going to happen if we do train 125 people. Or if we want to convert everything to an electronic media, there's an assumption a miracle will occur. We're going to save millions of dollars, we're going to do something. We're focused on trying to get that results. That's how we get in the door to negotiate other solutions if you're doing something like that. We do look at the work, the workplace, and the worker. You know, just look at people, look at that whole work environment, and something like that. Um, I will tell you that we're very big on engagement and collaboration, bringing the right people in to do that. We're not experts that come in and sprinkle dust, do that kind of stuff. We really very much that way. There's some other attributes about it. So that's a certification offered by ISPI. It's the only certification that's proficiency and competency based, meaning you get certified. You don't go to school, you don't pass a test, you don't read a book. You get certified because you've proven you can do the work in the real world. And you have attestations from your client that you did it and it met, and it goes through a peer review of how, what, how, how you did it. If you want to learn more, you can either send me an email at judyispi.org, or you can um, check it out. Or something like that. We are actually going to have you do some sort of a, maybe not a webinar, but something uh, sometime next spring for us to explain the CPT program for the chapter. 
I'd love to do that. We have uh, certified over 11, about 1,100 people. We have uh, people certified in 26 countries. I now can take applications in other languages. I can do German and Portuguese. I'm hoping to have Spanish fairly soon. Um, it's a debate if I can do French, because the French can't agree on what's French. <laughs> so, <laughs> you can't. I mean, if I, so, uh, something like that. We, uh, I mean, we have people in uh, Korea, and in Asia, uh, Australia, South Africa, North Nigeria, uh, throughout Europe, Canada, and the US, something like that. But we, we are a group that has shown that we can deliver in real world context. So it's not about passing a test or something like that. It's not about getting your case study and say what you do. Case study doesn't reflect the, like your politics, personalities or something like that. Do we have anybody in the room who's certified by ISBI? Yeah? Okay. So you've got resources, you've got three people here who are certified. If you close in, they can talk about what that involves or something like that. So do we have any other questions? I'm, I'm just... I'm, I'm personally learning about the politics and how you work it, and um, I think it's harder for those of you who are inside, by the way. Yes. How did you get interested in this topic? Politics? <laughs> well, it comes from two parts. But my, my biggest part is my observation about the downturn of economies, how people I care about get laid off and fired because they're seen as what they offer is not balanced. Mm -hmm. That was a real difficult insight. And I concluded that's because they just do good work, but they don't think about building influence and credibility and trust within that kind of group. That's what it is. And <clears throat> also, it's been a number of years when Caterpillar, uh, Caterpillar was by me, during a time when they had some very labor strife and things like that, it was the learning development group that was not laid off. It was not laid off in a very difficult time because they had established tremendous trust credibility and um, by the, the management really thought that what we did was okay. But they made that a point. Does that help you? So that was that observation. It was enough to Yes? Do you have any comments or feedback on seeing kind of networks where you map out influence networks, <coughs> informal, where you kind of say information flows through these people and you find the high leverage informal power networks within organizations? Well, that he, that's a very legitimate method that has to be done internally. That Japanese company I told you about definitely looks at their power brokers and their organization and where it is, knowing it changes what the issue is. So just because a power broker is good on that doesn't mean that person is going to be a power broker on another issue. So they do see it as a volatile issue, and that's one of the most sophisticated companies I've seen really do that. Uh, and, and that room's under lock and key, and nobody's ever gone in it. I mean, they, they, they really pay attention to it. One of my other clients uh, started doing that, this does it fairly well, looking at what's going on. And has actually an organization, doesn't have photographs, has an organizational chart and knowing that when they want to do things, where they think the resistors are. It's just like that little chart that I showed you. Who can we draw on to influence? How can we build them? How can we do those things? But it's being purposeful. It's that we're working with human beings. And some of those human beings are just wonderful people. And even wonderful people can make bad decisions. So we have to, we have to look at it that way. There was another hand back. Yes, sir. Uh, what, uh, what advice do you offer to people who are new to the field of performance improvement? Say that again. What advice do you have for people who are new to the field of performance improvement? If you're new to the field of performance improvement, I would tell you whether you pursue certification or not, at least get to know the standards. And that is, if you want to be a performance improvement, don't confuse the solution with the end. We, one of the biggest mistakes is we, we, we confuse the vehicle with the end state. Be really clear about what's the goal we're trying to get to, what's the problem we're trying to solve. And don't confuse that with the solution, which could be training, which could be uh, webinars, which could be technology, which could be <coughs> process redesign. Okay? So, so in performance improvement, a lot of consultants come in selling their solution. Uh, I'll pick on Lean. I believe in Lean. Lean has some wonderful stuff. Uh, Six Sigma is wonderful. 
but it's not the answer to every problem. So you have to understand when you're pushing your solution versus what's really the issue here. So if you're going to be a performance improvement, really make sure you understand what the real goals and issue are. Okay? And the other one is really make sure you engage you and that. Yes? Ma'am? Did you have a hand? Oh, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I had a stretch. Sorry about that. Okay. Question. Yes? You had said you feel sorry for the people on the inside. And since I'm an inside person, could you kind of expand upon that? I think it's harder on the inside. You have to understand, because I'm on the outside, I've been on the outside for a long time, I can fire clients. Mm -hmm. And I do. On the inside, you can't do that. You have to work with them no matter where they are. Mm -hmm. or, or you have to quit your job. You understand? So I think it's harder for you. So you have to be even better skilled at building influence and interpersonal skills. You owe it to yourself to really understand who's on the, who's in the know and what's happening. It's harder for you. That's what I mean. Thank you. I was working so hard now. I know why. <laughs> <laughs> and Judith, do you think under your personal power model, the number three opportunity uh, to get to be known by people, you have to expose yourself yeah, you to the right people, though. Right. You know? right. To the opportunity piece and the personal power. Opportunity. Model. In the inside, you can look at various committees and groups, whether it be the Christmas or whether it be the book drive, whatever it is. Those are opportunities where suddenly hierarchy melts away. And you're working with people at all different levels. It's a chance to get to be known and something like that. Those are terrific opportunities. Then you also have other initiatives and you see how you can contribute and what you're doing. You never know who's going to be in that room. And even right now, they might be the, the newbies. In the future, they could be a key customer. So this is a chance to look at that. So those, those are opportunities you can create for yourself. Now, when I started my own company, um, because I, one of my contracts was with the Department of Labor, I was introduced to the Industrial Relations Research Association. You can only join as an individual the company is not allowed to join. Because these people fought all day long. They were union organizers and union busters. And my joke was that they left the guns at the door, and they met once a month. And, but these are people who were vicious fighters all day, but that night they came in as civil peers, respectful peers. They put the guns out there and they came in. That was a huge learning experience for me. And I was not either one of those, I was one of those, I'm neutral, okay? And, and I was, and I mean, this is not my work, but I served on those committees and I got to know them and all that kinds of stuff. And, and I would have union organizers call me and say, we're getting ready to hire this consultant. Tell me, is, is he, I mean, is he a good guy? And I couldn't lie. I had to say, either I didn't know him or where that person was coming from. And the same thing, I would have the management side saying, you, is this a good guy? Let me do something like that. So I was seen as an honorable source of information that way. I did that for 10 years. That was a huge learning experience. I don't do anything with them anymore because I had to make some other choices. That was a huge opportunity for me to learn about labor law, to, to learn about what fact is. These are people who are arbitrators are there. So suddenly you know what hearsay and fact is. I thought all hearsay was fact. But anyway, not in the case like that. So you soon find out what's really evidence. So it was a huge learning opportunity. And it cost me $10 a week. I'll take it. So that was it. So, I, I was, so it's like those kinds of opportunities. Yes, was there another hand? So what, did you want to share what you discussed? Yes. So I'm about to start a new position as a performance consultant. And I have found out that I have to work with someone who was involved in a previous project. And my observation of that person from, from the previous project was that she wasn't very respectful of the people who had the experience because she had the experience. So they're quite she's very good need you. So listening to some of the things that you were talking about, we were talking about strategies of how I could get involved with this person and kind of bring her over to my side. And you know, some of the, the things that we could do, you know, to say it, you have a fabulous background, and I know you had experience with this other project. We're about to embark on this project. What, you know, what kind of lessons did you learn? What kinds of things would you like to see that you didn't see before? And you know, defer to her expertise, but also then hopefully establish my expertise as well. So 
it's been a good opportunity just to say, oh, I need to do that. I need to start working on that right now. <laughs> Otherwise, I don't have wait. I tell you, I'm just intrigued about passive aggressive behavior. Uh, the thing that really resonated with me is the whole area of emotional intelligence. It's kind of you know, how you wrapped it, if you will. And the other thing is the public relations side of it. You know, what is it, what is the research, what do you want people to, to do, say, or act differently when this thing is done? You have to be cognizant of that and help them frame what that is or something like that. Yeah. I will tell you on my example of the executives and the, their student behavior, intuitively they knew what they were doing wrong. They just didn't know how to get out of their own mm -hmm. So we got to well, I want to thank you all very, very much. I, I now look at your little thing. I want you to sign up for those future programs here. This is an opportunity to get to know, an opportunity to really network, get to know those people. And I'm really honored to have been invited. And I'm looking forward to a successful report card. <laughs> thank you, dude.